Hey folks, welcome back to the Wikipedia world and I am Abhinay Gupta and today again we will continue with the chapter audit and auditor right so if we look into the past about the lectures that we have already had on this topic right so this topic consists of section 139 to section 148 right and we are still with section 139 because that is the longest section in this chapter right so we have seen the provisions that relate to the appointment of the auditor in the AGM right in both in the case of all the companies whether it be company whose account audited by the auditor appointed by SAG, CAG or any other company right we have also seen the provisions that relate to the appointment of the first auditor right either by CAG or by director or by the member what are the provisions and when are they applicable we have seen the case of casual vacancy we have seen the case of filing up of casual vacancy right but all the sections or all the provisions that we have seen so far were all dealt or were all explained from the company's point of view right if you see then what are the provisions that relate to the company to appoint an auditor what does the company need right if you pay attention that is the only thing we have spoken so far but do you think that if i am an auditor right and any xyz company that decide to keep me as an auditor they'll just pull me in like that the answer is no <laughs> they cannot do that right there's a lot of checks and filters that they have to be placed right plus it is my consent also that is required i can only be the director of xyz if i wish to do do that apart from all the provisions of the on the company's end that we have checked apart from that it it is me who will decide whether or not i will or i won't right so let us look at the provision today that we carry that is the certificate and consent by the auditor right so this is basically section 139 of the company act so when we talk about the certificate and consent by auditor right so we need to understand that this certificate is to be given before the appointment by the auditor so if the company right the, if the company decides that yeah they are taking mr a as an auditor right so that company will go ahead and talk to mr a and then mr a who is the auditor right will give the certificate before the appointment and once everything is perfectly done it is signed on paper then mr a takes charge and is appointed as an auditor so this process of delivering the certificate of consent certificate and the consent will be taking place before the auditor takes over the office or before the appointment is completed right so how is this consent given this consent is given in a written document right it is a written consent for such appointment that yes i am so and so and i wish to take up the appointment of this this company from the date or the financial year starting this right and to whatever tenure it is maybe five term maybe whatever right and that certificate or uh, in that certificate he will certify that the appointment which is made right or if it will be successfully made right that shall be in accordance with the conditions that are prescribed and the conditions are basically prescribed in the rule number 4 right and plus they will also certify the criteria that are given in section 141 right so in writing what is the auditor supposed to give is the consent that yes i am willing to take up the audit right plus all the conditions that have been prescribed have been fulfilled right plus i satisfy all the criteria of section 141 now what does section 141 stand for right so since we said that this chapter will cover section 139 to section 148 that means 141 will be covered later in the chapter which deals with the qualification and disqualification of an auditor right so please keep all your questions parked related to this section because in next one or two lectures we'll take up that section okay so now when we saw the conditions have to be fulfilled right so what are those condition we say that the condition as prescribed by the act so the conditions are prescribed in the rule and rule 4 takes care so let us see what are the conditions that are prescribed so basically we have four conditions one that he is not disqualified that means an individual that who is the, who is going to be the auditor or the firm in any case is eligible to become an auditor of the company right who is eligible for an appointment and is not disqualified for the appointment under the act which act the chartered accountant act right it is not under the company's act right because the company's act 
deals with the sections that would relate to the company right they will not define what are the qualifications and disqualifications of an auditor they'll just say that whatever be the qualification disqualification of the auditor the auditor should be qualified as per those qualification and disqualification and those qualification and disqualification will obviously be given in the chartered accountant act right so when you analyze things from this angle right you understand what sections and what uh, acts are you referring to so it will be related to the chartered accountant act 1949 and the rules that are related to that act right after that the proposed appointment should be as per the terms which are provided in the act now when we talk about appointment as per the terms in the act now this is company's act because now we are not specifically looking at the auditor we are looking at the appointment of that auditor in the company so this provisions will relate only in the company's act not in the chartered accountant act right so you need to understand that whenever you write the term act right please specify what act are you referring to when the entire question in your examination refers to the company's act it is a very deemed situation you can write the act if you don't have time but if you have time please specify that the act that you're talking about whether it is the company's act or is it the chartered accountant act right and if you don't have a lot of time in the examination the best cleverest way thing that you can do is to refer the company's act as act always and whenever there is any other act peeping in just write the full name that means it is deemed that whenever you're talking about act it is the company's act right and that is also acceptable by the institute not a problem with that right second you all know that there is a limit to the number of audits that an auditor can undertake so that limit has to be seen that means this appointment which is proposed to that auditor right should be within the limits which are laid down under the authority of the act okay after this last is the pending proceedings against the firm partner or the auditor so you'll have to prepare the list of all the proceedings which are against the auditor or the audit firm or if it is not against the audit firm in the case of firm it's only in case of a single partner then even that has to be specified right like understand if mr a is appointed as an auditor then you'll have to prepare a list of the proceedings of mr a if firm abc is appointed right and mr c only has some proceedings against him then you will have to specify even that so either the proceedings are related to the individual who is appointed or if in the case of firm if any one partner also is appointed it should not mandatorily be the proceeding in the name of the firm it can be a proceeding in the name of any particular partner right so you'll prepare the list of all the proceedings right that is pending with respect to the professional matter of conduct right then you'll disclose it in the certificate and you'll attest that yes it is true and correct that means you have already specified all the proceedings in respect to the professional conduct that are against you getting the point so that even the company has the entire justification right when they evaluate you as an auditor that okay even if there was the proceeding pending it was not major it was this is this and it is acceptable to the law to the act and everything so whatever justification is required you understand right that is why when the auditor gives his consent the auditor takes care of four things that yes i will take up the audit i am not disqualified i am within the limits right my appointment is done as per the act the company that this is the list of all the pending proceedings against me when he has supplied all these four information it will be deemed that yes the auditor is willing to take up the audit otherwise he would not have been giving these details right he would have straight away rejected the application got it so that was about the certificate that he gives and the consent by the auditor now moving ahead there are certain miscellaneous provisions also that we'll see but before that let's check out what is the requirement for the notice of appointment by company so in the case of the notice of appointment uh, to be given by the company to the auditor once the consent is there see the company has appointed the auditor the auditor gave his consent that okay i'll be the auditor now what now you have to issue the letter of appointment right so the company shall inform the auditor concerned that okay you are appointed if it's a firm that okay your firm has been appointed as the auditor of our company right and then after the auditor has been intimated they'll have to file a notice of the appointment whether it be of the firm or it be of the auditor with the registrar in form ADT1 right and this will be done within 15 days of the meeting in which the auditor is appointed right so when we say auditor is appointed means 
I have taken in the decision that I'll take Mr. AB as an auditor. Then Mr. AB gives his consent and his certificate. Then I send him a notice of appointment and that is when he's appointed. And then after he's appointed, within 15 days, I'll have to send or file a notice with the registrar in form ADT1. Okay with that? Now the last part of uh, this lecture that we'll take up is the miscellaneous provisions of section 139. Now, why is this miscellaneous provision important? See, you also have a chapter of miscellaneous provisions, right? We often tend to overlook. Why? It's a small chapter, doesn't contain a lot of weightage and all those things. Is what generally pops up in a student's mind. But my dear friend, try and understand. You're not here just to qualify your examination. Just to mug up the chapters which are important, which are high weightage, format it down on the paper and qualify. No. What you basically need to do is for yourself. Right? You need to be educated. You need to be knowledgeable. So to complete the entire understanding of any subject, right? those miscellaneous provisions are very important. Because that is where you exactly get the meaning behind any specific section. Why so? What is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of that? So to understand any act or any session in totality, section in totality, right? you should be going through the miscellaneous provision without bringing it into mind whether or not it is important for the examination. Right? Maybe the institute may not ask any questions from the miscellaneous provision, but that will at least make your understanding crystal clear. Right? So when we look at the miscellaneous provisions, section 139, so we have certain of them. Number one is that the firm includes LLP. Right? If, if you wouldn't have read this, right? if you wouldn't have been a part of any of the big four organizations, or among the best organizations, I would say, there is a high chance that in an examination, if you would have received a question, right, and you would have seen that the firm is actually an LLP, there is high probability that you would get confused. But whether or not a limited liability partnership is accepted as a firm in this context, right? Because yeah, when you get an experience into the big four or the best audit firms across the country, you know that they themselves have that limited liability partnership thing with them. And being into a limited liability partnership, they get that audit. Right? So it is definite that yes, an LLP would also be considered. An LLP is a valid firm. Right? So for the purpose of this chapter, which is audit and auditor, right? We are dealing with certain sections. So over here, whenever we talk about the word firm, right, it would include the limited liability partnership, which is incorporated under the Limited Liability Partnership Act 2008. Right? This doesn't mean that wherever we're talking about the firm, we're talking about LLP. Right? But whenever we are talking about the auditors in specific, that we are taking up the auditors, right? we will be taking up a limited liability partnership firm as well. Right? Now, what do you understand by the term appointment? Appointment would anytime include reappointment as well. Right? Because when an auditor is reappointed, right? understand that reappointment is his fresh appointment for a new term. Right? Although he is being reappointed because he has already served a tenure of one term. That firm, right? When we talk about reappointment, please forget the past baggages. Now is the start of the new term and this auditor has been appointed. Irrespective of whether this auditor was with me previously also, whether this auditor is a new auditor. But this term is a new term. So in this term, he has been appointed. So appointment would always include reappointment, right? And now when we, you remember when we were talking about the appointment, who recommends the name of the auditor? We had a discussion over there. So if there is an applicability of section 117, which is the formation of an audit committee. So if there is a company that has an audit committee, then the audit committee would recommend the name of the auditors to the director. And then the director would further filter it and refer it to the company, to the members, right? So understand one specific thing, that casual vacancy situation also, the audit committee role will stay there. You understand why is an audit committee prepared? An audit committee is prepared to assist the board into the matters of audit. Right? So the board of directors, they have a lot of work to do. Now they will not go ahead and evaluate all the auditors and do all the testing and all the checking and then recommend to the members. Right? They have a lot of work to do. So when they have created this committee, the audit committee, right? then they have created this audit committee to support them in the matters of audit. So if there is an audit committee that exists, then they will support them in the matter of appointment, they will support them in the matter of reappointment, and they will also support the directors in the matter of casual vacancy. 
let us assume that yes or not assume let us understand that yes audit committee is the first people to take charge of the audit functions if they are not able to do it then the directors they take place right so don't be confused in the examination if you are talking about an audit committee being present and you are talking about a casual vacancy and you will say okay, okay sir did not teach us this uh, concept what to do in this deadly combination and <laughs> please yeah take, take a breath always go back to your roots and understand the reason of everything that is happening right so at the crux the reason of founding that audit committee was to assist right so in case of casual vacancy why won't you take their assistance it is a job right to assess the board in, the, in terms of audit let them do it okay with that so with that we'll come to an end of this lecture and we'll take up the provisions of the other sections in the subsequent lectures right so until then this is Abhinay Gupta signing off. Thank you and bye bye. I'll see you guys back in the next lecture and take the section ahead. Right? You remember we were talking about section 141? Yes, so we will be taking up section 141 in the next lecture after completing 140. Sorry. This is 139, right? So we'll first complete 140 and then move on to 141. Right? So see you guys in the next lecture. Thank you and bye bye.